Hey, I'm on. Uh, the last time I spoke, um, we made a bit of a faux pas, and I didn't turn the mic on, so <laughs> we got no audio the entire service, so uh, making doubly sure that I'm on, because nothing says, oops, like uh, there's <laughs> no audio. <laughs> Just end up looking like a weird Chinese film. You know, like one of those kung fu movies? Okay, maybe. All right, well, we're going to come down here. All right. Well, my parents send you a greeting there in Denver this morning. Um, the mountain air called. No, I'm kidding. Uh, my grandmother lives there, my mom's mom, and as an early uh, opportunity to go and see her for Mother's Day, they took the advantage. And so, you get me, so... I hope you enjoy. No, I'm, um, they send their love, and we're going to have an awesome time this morning. Uh, but we're going to continue talking about prayer. We've been going through prayer, and uh, last week my dad, uh, Pastor Craig, I have to remind myself that I can't just say my dad and have everybody know it. I know most people do, but it's just one of those shifting things. Uh, Anybody ever call their parents by the first name and find out what happens? <laughs> I think I only did that like once. And there's that weird transition when you come into adulthood, because there's still no way I'm going to call my dad by his first name. I'm not going to say, hi, Craig. Uh, yeah, no, it's, even now, <laughs> that's not happening. But we're going to continue talking about prayer, because prayer is vital. As a child of God, as a believer, prayer is one of the strongest weapons that we have. Mm. So let's go ahead and pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. You said, in, you said Father God, that the entrance of your word brings light. Lord, this morning I ask that your light would shine through every bit of darkness. Lord, that your joy would just come and flood. Oh, Holy Spirit, we give ear to you this morning. You said in your word, that he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, in this morning we determine with our hearts that we're going to listen, that we are going to hear, and everything that you tell us, Lord, will do. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. All right. Well, here we go. Like we said, we've been talking about prayer, and last week we talked about some of the very basic beginnings of how do I pray. And the first thing that we talked about is that when we pray, what we do is we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Now, does that to imply that if you say, Holy Spirit, I thank you that the Holy Spirit and God are like going to get in a fist fight because, well, he prayed to you. Well I, well, I can't help what he prays. No, that's not what happens. The, the Trinity, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are not jealous of each other by any way, shape, or form. But what we're doing when we pray to the Father in Jesus' name is we're being obedient to the pattern that Jesus showed us. You see, the responsibilities of the Godhead are this. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God's presence here on the earth. And his job is to reveal to us who Jesus is. Okay, well then what does Jesus do? Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, Jesus reveals the Father. And the Father loves us. And this morning, that's, kind of, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about trusting the Father. As we, get, as we begin to move into prayer, we are confronted with an immediate question. What do I believe? You see, nothing will really tell you what you know like experience. 
Anybody ever had somebody tell them how to do a job, how to do a procedure, something around the house, how to make a, uh, how to bake a cake? The very first time you do it on your own, even if you've had somebody tell you time and time and time again, it's a little bit different. That's what prayer is. Prayer is how we walk out what we believe. And so this morning, we're asking the question, what do I believe? And it's very, very important. Just so you know, um, if you'll turn on, turn, turn on. If you'll turn to the back of your bulletin, there is a handy little uh, fill in the blank thingy. And if you don't have any pens or pencils, you can ask uh, Randy Moreland. He always has a bunch. I'm kidding. <laughs> Surprise. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, we do have some uh, pencils in the back if you need them. Our belief is shaped like a landscape. You ever, anybody ever seen pictures or anybody actually been to the Grand Canyon? That, that's on my bucket list of places to go. I just, I see pictures of it and it's just like, man, ugh. To be able to see, I've, I've been to Western Colorado and Western Colorado has similar rocks and I, it's just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But if you see the pictures of the Grand Canyon, what's at the bottom of it? A river. That river shaped, among other things, the Grand Canyon. And it's amazing to think that just water going over something can erode and completely tear away the land. But it does. Our belief is like a landscape. And it's shaped by what we experience through our lives and what we are told in our upbringing. As we get older, as we mature through life, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because uh, most people are a little older than I am, so I'm not telling you anything new. But as we go through life, our experiences shape what we think. It shapes how we view people. And it comes into contrast by the things that we were told growing up. One of the best um, pieces of information I think I've ever heard was that uh, there was some research done by the Barna Group. And they said that by the time you were 13, you've made the major decisions in, your, in the way that you think. You think the way that you do by the time you're 13 years old. That's how impactful those, those, those first years are in our lives. And I, I'm sure I could go around the room and tell you and, and ask, and what was one thing that your mother or your father said to you growing up that just made an impact? And we'd all have something to say, right? Sometimes those are good things, sometimes those are not good things. I was blessed to have both of my parents in the house the entire time. They're still there. They're still married. And sadly, right now that's not something that we're seeing. But those things, the, 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 what we're told and what we experience, shape what we believe. And we come into a problem with that because of one thing, the blood of Jesus. You see, when you became a believer, when you stood up and said, Lord, I give you every part of my life, I am yours 100%, from that moment on, the Bible says that you became a new creature. 
brand new, never before seen on the face of the planet. The real part of you that got saved was your spirit. We are what's called triune beings. Now, that's a really fancy way of saying there's three parts to you. A triune beings just, somebody came up with it and said, wow, I feel Spartan. Woohoo. Probably one of the PhDs guy, PhD guys, who knows. I don't know, maybe it was an engineer. Engineers like feeling smart. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But triune being means you're, you have three parts. The real you is a spirit. It's going to live forever. This isn't just you, this is all, mankind. That's the real you. That spirit man has a soul. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. All of those things reside in this guy right here. In your body, your flesh, your bones, your blood, your cells. That's who you are. When you were first saved, the part of you that got made brand new was your spirit. And for the rest of your life, the work of the Father God is bringing the rest of your body, your spirit, or your spirit which, which got made new, but your soul and your body, the rest of your life, you're bringing them into subjection. You're saying, no, you're going to follow what the spirit says. Romans, 8, Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says this. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now remember, we're talking about prayer, and we're talking about what we believe. You see those, that old nature, what we experienced, what we were told growing up, doesn't always line up with the Word of God. And if we don't confront it, then we face the possibility of not following what the Word of God says. And remember, when we're talking about prayer, we're saying, this is what I believe. And it's impactful because every question that we have in our life will stem from what that is. The answer to that question, what do I believe, will tell, will tell me what I believe about God, who God is to me. Do I believe that God is this big ogre with, with a stick that every time uh, that he's just up there waiting and every time I stub my toe and I swear, bam, whoo, yeah, that, okay, yeah, do it again. Do we see God as the permissive parent that says, you know what, it's okay. It doesn't matter, I love you anyways. Is that true? Uh, partly, yes. There's nothing, it's true that there is nothing that I can do, there's nothing you can do that can make God love you any less. Just in the same way that there's nothing you can do that will make God love you more. That is 100% true. But don't think for a moment that because the love of God is that great, that when you sin, you won't walk into the consequences of it. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. If you're walking in sin, if you're living in habitual sin where this is just what, this is what I do, there comes a point in time, because there's things that we wrestle with, but there's a point in time where you have to say, look, either I'm a child of God or I'm not. And if you're not following after the things of God, if you have no desire to follow after the things of God, guess whose child you are? Now, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that to say, look, you bad person, you, because that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. 
But if we allow ourselves to say, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter, then we find ourselves in places that are really, really sketchy. We find ourselves in places where we're supposed to be light and we're not. One of the things that um, you'll hear throughout a lot of modern Christian music, um, and it's not necessarily bad per se, but it's that God is our anchor in the storm. If you've ever been out to sea during a storm, the anchor is not what you want to use. That is the last thing that you need in the middle of a storm is an anchor. That's not what it's for. An anchor is for when everything is calm or when you need to stay in one spot. Because the anchor will keep you from drifting. And if we allow ourselves to step away and say, okay, yes, I realize that the Bible says it's wrong, but you know, I really don't want you to feel bad about it. We remove our anchor. We remove what is true. This really isn't even part of what I'm going over, so that one that part was free. <laughs> But we're talking about prayer, and we're talking about what we believe. And we're talking about what we believe because the very first thing that we have to do when we come into prayer is determine what we want from God. If you don't say, God, I need a new car. If you don't say, God, I need healing in my arm, in my eyes, in my feet. It's not going to happen. But that first step is saying, Lord, I believe that you love me so much that when your son, Jesus, was on earth, that he was beaten mercilessly, mercilessly, and took stripes from a cat of nine tails where his flesh was literally ripped open and his internal organs were visible. That type of a beating. That he took that type of a beating so I didn't have to be sick. So I thank you for your healing, Lord. If you paid the price for it, Lord, I want it. That's the gift of God to you. But if we don't believe that God is a healer, we'll never ask. If we don't believe that God saves, that, his, that he's powerful, nah. Too many times what we hear about God and what we believe about God co coincides a whole lot more with the God of the insurance companies than it does with the God of the Bible. God of the insurance companies, what? You ever heard of acts of God? Tornadoes, wind, wind damage, earthquakes, floods, fires, some fires. They call that an act of God. Now, I'm not, if there's any insurance people in here, I know that's not you. God, we love you. God loves you. The Aflac commercials are funny and so are the Guy Cohen's. But too, but too often we kick back and say, well, that must have been what God, the will of God was. And instead of taking it to the Bible and saying, what does the Bible say? We allow what our experience and we allow what our upbringing tells us to determine what's right and what's wrong. The first thing that we do when we pray is we determine what we want from God. Now here's the awesome thing. 
God knows what we want. He knows what we need. And here's why it's so powerful. When we are specific and we stand on the promises of God in his word, we begin to hear and we begin to read how God took, uh, took dirt and mud, spat in a dude's eye, and began to rub it. Now, am I telling people to go spit in people's eyes and rub dirt in it? No. Unless the Holy Spirit tells you to. It worked for Jesus. If, if the Holy Spirit says go do that, by all means, go do it. If it doesn't work, okay, at least you tried. It'd be a really awesome story, sort of. <laughs> But as we read what's in the Bible, as we spend time with the Father, He begins to talk to us about what we need. You see, the Father God knows exactly what we need before we even ask. And when we come to Him, when we spend time with Him, the very person who set the earth in motion just with the power of His Word begins to talk to us and begins to say, hey, you know that, that, that pain that you've been having in your left arm? I want to heal that. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. If there's oppression in your life, if there's an area where darkness is coming in and causing you grief, The Word of God wants to change that. The Spirit of God, the will of God is that it changes. I don't care what it is. If we'll be specific and stand on God's promises, God will tell us what He wants us to hear. It's like this, we read God's word and he shows us his will. And in his will, we begin to see what he wants for us, which is exactly what we need. We have to come back to what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. We have to come back to what the Bible says about who God is, what his character is, how he acts. Because if we'll take what this says over what our experience tells us, we'll see breakthrough. The second part of that is we pray according to the word of God. Do you know there are prayers in the Bible uh, beyond just uh, the Lord's Prayer? There are prayers all throughout the scriptures, really good ones. If the book of Ephesians is chopped full of them. I'm telling you what, there is so much in the book of Ephesians you could just go through them line by line and just start praying for people exactly what's written. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a great for instance here. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, if you will. I'm going to show you. Chapter 1 and verse 17. And this is Paul. This is Paul praying for the Ephesians. This is an example of a prayer that you can pray for yourself, that you can pray for someone else. Verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints. It goes on, I mean, for verses, and just talking about being filled with the knowledge of God, being filled with the power and the light of the Father. I mean, these are powerful things. And this is an example of one. 
Just one thing. And if we'll take things like that and pray what's in the word of God, watch what happens. I speak from personal experience. When I have prayed this for people, when I begin to confess the word of God, Lord, I thank you for so-and-so. Lord, that they are filled with the knowledge of God. That they are filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge. Whoo. It's effective because you're praying right out of the word of God. Kenneth Hagin said this. Kenneth Hagin uh, has since gone on to be with the Lord, but he was an amazing, amazing man of God. Had some of the most groundbreaking revelations about faith and prayer and serving the Lord that have come out in, in the last hundred or even more years. Amazing, amazing man of God. I highly recommend if you get an opportunity, look on YouTube, Kenneth Hagin. And, and listen to some of, his, uh, some of his old messages because they're powerful. But he said this, many believers are trying to pray beyond their faith. But it's the word that gives you faith. You see, a lot of times, and, and I'm just speaking from personal experience, my prayer life tends to be reactionary. Oh my gosh, this is happening. And then I pray about it. Oh my goodness, this is what's going on. I need to pray. And you ever feel like in that moment where you're just helpless? Where there's just like, you're trying to grasp at a rope as you're falling? You get that same emotion? When we pray, when we pray according to the word, and when we get in the word as we spend time with God, our faith, which fuels our, the, the fire of God on the inside of us, which fuels our prayer life, begins to grow. Someone said it like this, it's like bodybuilding for your spirit. If you were going into a fight, uh, somebody said, if you, were gonna, uh, if you were gonna fight Mike Tyson back in the 80s, when he was just knocking dudes out in like three seconds, what would you do? Besides get a really big helmet. <laughs> you'd train, right? You'd go, you'd get running and uh, you'd run every day and you'd do as many push-ups as you could and you'd start lifting weights and you'd start uh, learning, hopefully, uh, from some people who knew a thing or two about boxing, right? The same thing in the spirit. If, you're, if you know that you're in the middle of a situation, man, dig into the word of God. Dig in. Because the more time you spend with the spirit of God, the more time you spend in the word, worshiping, listening to good praise and worship music, building your spirit, the more power you have. And this is why it's so important because you don't know what's coming around the corner. Maybe you're not in a place where you're in life-threatening things. Maybe you are. Get in the word. Get in the word. Learn what the word of God has to say about your situation. Whether it's issues in marriages, whether it's issues with children, whether it's issues with finances, whether it's issues with health, the answer is in the word. The more, actually before I go there, Joshua 1.8 says this. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. And when people quote this verse, that's usually where they stop.
But let's read what the next part of it is. For then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall deal wisely and have good success. I didn't write it. That's in the word of God. So Monday morning, when you wake up, this is what we need to say. Lord, I thank you that your word is before me. You know what? I, I think I've said it before, but one of the most amazing things I ever heard, saw anybody do was a friend of mine when I lived in Chicago. Uh, I went over and spent the night with him and his family, and his wife had taken uh, like a magic marker, like a, I don't know, some sort of marker, and took plates, and the little plate display things, and she'd written scripture verses everywhere. I mean, you couldn't see a spot in her house that there wasn't a scripture verse, and it was written out, and I was like, this is awesome, because I mean, everywhere you turn, for God so loved the world, Jesus came, I mean, and it was just like, whoa, and it built your faith. You'd go to the bathroom, and look, oh, there's something on the mirror as you're washing your hands. The more you put the Word of God in front of you, whether it says a sticky note on the dashboard of your car, whether it's uh, the screensaver on your computer, the more you fill yourself and surround yourself with the Word of God, the more powerful you become. The more you build up your muscles, your spiritual muscles, so when the enemy comes in, you're ready to go. I hate the devil. I hate the devil. He is stolen from so much and so many of us. There isn't a person in here he hasn't stolen from. And he doesn't care. He'll do it to children. He'll do it to whomever. And when we prepare ourselves, we give opportunity to step into our own lives, to step into the lives of other people, and to just throw haymakers at the devil. I mean, just right smack in the nose. The more we read and meditate on the word of God, the more faith-filled we become. I must learn to trust the word of God more than I trust my own common sense. Common sense is good. Common sense tells you if there's a car that is coming from the moment that you walk out the door, don't stand in front of it. Amen? Every one of us would say, yes, that's a bad idea. There's nothing wrong with that common sense. And one of the biggest critiques about people of faith, about people who would consider themselves charismatic, filled with the Holy Spirit, is that they've got no sense. And that shouldn't be. Because God gave you common sense. He gave you that experiential knowledge to say, you know what? If I put my hand on the hot stove, it's going to hurt. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is never something that we need to shut down or say stop until it contradicts the word of God. Because the moment that it contradicts the word of God, we have an opportunity we have an opportunity to say, Lord, I believe you, or circumstance, I believe you. You see, there's a difference between what is correct and what is true. I know some people have said, uh, said this differently. They've said, there's a difference between true and truth. Uh, that's a little too close for me. Correct, I think, is a better way to put it. All of us here have gone through a certain measure of school. And we all learned that 4 plus 4 equals 8. 
5 plus 4 equals 16. Thank you. We all learn those things. Those are correct. Men, we love being correct. Amen? <laughs> Not necessarily in arguments, per se, but in measurements. I remember uh, with my grandfather, one of the things he taught me was... You, Measure twice, cut once, or you'll measure once and cut twice, right? We love being right on and saying, this is correct. And as a society, we are that same way. We love being correct. We love being able to say, you know what? That person is doing this, 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 and this. And listing off everything that we know is going on. And then we begin to talk about it. Because sometimes it's, it's like not eating the second chocolate cookie. It's just too good. You ever sat there with an open box of cookies and not ate in the whole box? Or tried to? <laughs> no. I know nobody here has ever done that. That's the people across the street that we're talking about. Not us, though. But too many times, those things that are correct, that we know are actually happening, are not true. What do you mean? I mean this. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is what's true. What Jesus thinks about you is true, regardless of what is correct. What Jesus thinks about the people that we're talking about, that we're concerned about, that's true. And too many times we come into agreement with what is correct. And we were never called as people of God to come into agreement just with what is correct. Does it mean that we don't say, hey, sin is sin? Absolutely not. Does it mean that we can't make a strong stand and say, you know what? This is wrong. It's not supposed to happen like this. But the moment we start coming into agreement with something that is not what the Lord Jesus is saying about someone, we walk into sin. Because we come into agreement with death. If you can't imagine Jesus saying that about a person, if you can't imagine the love of God expressing that about what this person is going through, you don't need to say it. And it's really hard because a lot of times it's really ridiculous stuff. I heard uh, a story about a famous pop star. If I, if I told you the, the person, every single, per, everyone in the room would know it. This person is saying at a Super Bowl within the last couple years. You know who they are. And who, what they stand for is completely against everything that is in the Word of God. So much. Not very long ago... The Spirit of God moved on the heart of her manager, and he got saved. Now, he'd had a shift in clientele, I guess. I don't know how that works. But he'd moved on to some other people. But the Spirit of the Lord had changed his heart. Come in, he'd gotten saved, delivered from drugs, alcohol, the whole, the whole thing. He'd done a complete 180 and changed his life. Well, that, the pop star came into town where he lived, and because he was friends with all of those people, he said, okay, you know what, let me go and see my friends, I'll say hi, it's kind of a business thing at the same time, it's good. Well, he, so he goes in there, and he's brought, because he knows everyone, into the back room, into the VIP section, right? And as you can imagine, everything is going on. There is drugs, there is anything, you name it. It's there. But because the Spirit of the Lord has changed his heart, he's not having a part of it. 
Well, so he runs into the pop star and says, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm so glad to see you, yada, yada, yada. And they begin to strike up a conversation. He said, and she says, well, here, it's really loud. Let's go, let's go talk over here. And so they begin to talk and she says, you're different. You're not, the, you were the life of the party before. What's going on? You were n normally the one who started everything, but you're not. And he begins to tell her about what the love of God has done in his life. He begins to tell and say, hey, you know what? I was doing this, but, and, and just as raw and just real with her. And she sits there and says, you know what? That is the most real spiritual experience I've ever had anyone tell me. It's not flaky, it's, not, it's real, I just don't know how to explain it. I'm not ready to become a Christian right now, but there's just something there. Now when I heard the person, I'm not gonna say who they are, because it's not really important. But when I heard this story, and they told me who it was, I had a check in my heart. Because I've had conversations with other people about this person. Man, I can't believe they, this is what they stand for, and this is what they flaunt, and this is how, and it is just a, an example of everything that is getting pushed down our throat, and yada, that, 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 and so on and so forth. Now don't get me wrong, I believe strongly that we are to be vocal in what we believe. That we are to be vocal and evident. Because when we're vocal and evident, it gives us prominence. And it gives a place, it, it means that stuff just doesn't happen. But there is a time and a place when we stop Speaking the words that Jesus would speak. I want to read to you out of Ze the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 19. This is one, or sorry, verse 17. This is one of the most amazing scriptures in all the Bible. And it says, the Lord your God is in the midst of you. A mighty one, a savior who saves. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction and in his love, he will be silent and make no mention of past sins or even recall them. And here's the one thing I want to uh, highlight. He will exult over you. Sing. You know that God sings songs over you? He does. He says it right there. The same way, with the same love that you would sing over your child, that same love the Father has for us. That same love that would cause Him to sing over you. He has for those people. I don't care where they're at. I don't care what is going on in their life. I don't care what ridiculousness they're in the midst of. We can speak love. We don't have to come into agreement with death. And what I want to challenge you this morning is to ask yourself, what do I believe? Because we're talking about prayer and we're talking about how do I work out, how do I say, okay God, here's what I need to do. Here's how I need to love. Here's what you want to do in that person's life. The things that you see with your eyes as a believer Especially if they're off, if there's something that's just, there's an issue there. That's a message from the Holy Spirit. Saying you need to pray for them. Not go talk to someone, not go and express this. 
you specifically, when you see it, begin to intercede for them. Begin to pray, Lord, I thank you for so-and-so. Lord, I ask that you would fill them with the knowledge of God. Lord, let them understand your love. The Bible says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Does that mean conviction doesn't come? Absolutely not. But the Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction. And when we make way for him to work, he does like nobody else can. You see, most people don't have a view of Father God that's one of love. Do you know that God would go to war over you? You're that significant. God has gone to war over you, for you. He cares about you that much that he is willing to go to war with your enemies. As a matter of fact, he is at war this very moment with your enemies. The ones who are saying things that are about you, the ones who are pushing people to do things and say things and slander you. He is working behind the scenes in ways you, that we're not gonna know until we get up to heaven to work things out for your benefit because you're his daughter, you're his son. When we come to the name of, when we come to the Father and ask in the name of Jesus, using his word, we set ourselves up for success. And I'm going to close with this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What do you need from God this morning? Every single person in here should be able to say, I need something. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for someone that you love. Maybe it's for someone that you met on the road today. Maybe it is for you. If you will ask, if you'll determine what it is, say, Lord, I need this, and you'll ask, you're setting yourself up for success. And this is why belief is so important. Because if we don't believe, if we don't say, you know what, Lord, this is what you do, we're just saying words. But that's not who we are. That's not what the love of God on the inside of us does. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for every single person here. Lord, within the sound of my voice, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each and every situation that's, that's represented here. Lord, it is your desire this morning to break into lives. It is your desire this morning, Heavenly Father, to break into situations. If there's a situation that you are facing, whether it's yourself or someone that you know, that you need 
breakthrough in that you need a, a move from God, I want you to raise your hand. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want us to do. <coughs> Excuse me. If you raised your hand, I want you to step out in faith. And I want you to stand up. Those of us who are sitting down, I want you to look around. And I want you to go, and I want you to find someone. And what I want you to do is pray with them. We're going to pray corporately, but what I want you to do is ask them, what can I agree with you in prayer about? And then I want you to pray being specific and asking the Father to move. Okay. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Father. Just want you to go ahead. You, you, you can get up. Let's move. I don't want any. Let's not let anybody not have someone to pray with them for. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just when you go up to him, just say, hey, what can, I, what can I agree with you in prayer for? And if it's something that's personal, you don't necessarily have to spill the whole thing. Just give him a, a, a general idea. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, we just worship you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you. There's still some people that, are, that need some people to be prayed with. Thank you, Father God. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we just begin to, pre we begin, we begin to press in this morning. Lord, we thank you specifically for your move. We thank you for specific areas of breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus. Specific areas of breakthrough. Oh, Lord God in lives, we just begin to declare breakthrough. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. We begin to thank you for lives being changed. Lord, we thank you for healing in Jesus' name. We begin to thank you, Holy Spirit, that what you are doing is good. We begin to thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Oh, we thank you, Father God. Lord, you, the entrance of your word brings life. It brings life in the name of Jesus. Oh, just begin to thank him. Begin to thank him for what he's done. Begin to thank him in the name of Jesus. That's it. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Specific areas of breakthrough. Lord, I thank you for breakthrough. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, we just begin to declare your word. Oh, Father God, thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Oh, thank you. Oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, as we're just sitting, we're just praying. We're praying. We're worshiping the Lord, and we're, we're thanking the Lord for each of the people around us. We're thanking Him. In Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. If there's some people that haven't been prayed with, I want to encourage you. Go, let's find the people who have not been prayed for you. Let's keep praying for them. Oh, Randarada Shandarada Parada Kiriasho. Oh, 
Oh, you're worthy. You're worthy. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You're worthy, Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're worthy. You're worthy, Heavenly Father. Breakthrough. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in Jesus' name. Oh, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you for your body. Lord, you love your body in Jesus' name. Oh, If you've been prayed for and you're, and, and you're ready to move, uh, begin to keep going. If there's still some people who haven't been prayed for, let's make sure everyone's getting prayed for this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Worthy, worthy, worthy. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Oh, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hmm. This is why we come here. This, as we're finishing up, I want to keep this attitude of prayer, but this is why we're here. We are... I see a new beginning in my church, said the Lord, but it is one that will stride on, but must come close to me. It is my word that brings life to your people. And to my people, my word must become first, and then it must become the life to you, said the Lord. It is my word that brings you my path into you. For I have set before you today victory. I have set before you today.